Welcome back to the Curative Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Sutarji, and this is a podcast where I interview entrepreneurs and creatives to share their journeys and life lessons with you all. I'm excited for this season. This is season two of the podcast, and I have a great lineup of guests. For this episode, I have Mikey Replon. He is an aerospace engineer and barista. We talk about coffee, and we totally nerd out on it. We talk about his experiences with the coffee competition and community, and we talk about prioritizing the things that you love in your life. Um, I'm excited for this episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube, rate and write a review on Apple Podcasts or any platform that you listen to, and just enjoy the show. So thank you, Mikey, for coming to my podcast. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, it's been a while. Actually, I've seen you. So like, this is probably going to be an opportunity just to catch up on life and everything, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for people that don't know, we're, we went to college together. Uh, we were in the Filipino club, and we did a lot of activities where, you know, just participated in a lot of events and stuff. Um, but it's been a while since both you and I graduated. Yeah. And, you know, you live in, the, you live in SoCal, right? Right. And you're just coming here for just a weekend. Yeah, so, I was visiting for a wedding. Yeah, but like uh, I'm just so like happy like this actually worked out. Yeah, so, exactly. Way the time's lined up. So like, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Thanks for like doing this last minute because yeah, we, course. you know, we we hit you up like two days ago, right? <laughs> yeah, we're like, oh, hours. you're here for yeah. a few hours. Let's let's just catch up yeah. and hang out. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. So why don't you tell the audience what you do full time and yeah, sure. um, what you do as hobbies, and we'll get to what you what we want to talk about basically yeah okay so uh hi everybody my name is michael Raplan. um right now i work in los angeles as an aerospace engineer specifically space systems uh i wear a lot of hats but basically what i do is uh i work on a weather satellite a specific payload within the satellite uh and i do a lot of integration and testing so what that means is when you're building this uh scientific instrument uh, from card level, like the actual the processor cards, all the way to the full instrument assembled together. Along the way, while you build it from card to larger units, to units to boxes, boxes to subsystems, subsystems to systems, uh, you kind of do tests along the way to make sure that as you build it, nothing goes wrong. And you basically test it the way you fly it. Um, and then from there, uh, that here's where I wear a lot of hats, is uh, actually support it during launch as well and during when it's operational in space. So it's a very dynamic kind of engineering where uh, you pull a lot of knowledge from different uh, disciplines, especially disciplines that you didn't really study for. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's systems engineering there is just uh, applying all of that different sy- uh, disciplines into one whole. Uh, outside of work, uh, recently the biggest thing in my life has been coffee. Uh, outside of aerospace engineering, I work as a barista uh, part-time every Sunday mornings at Coffee Hall Arts District, shout out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's just a lot of fun. It's a totally different type of uh, kind of work. It's more of like a passion project. Like, uh, I mean, I still get paid for it as a barista, but it, it's more than that. It's just being uh, really engaging to people of all walks of life and uh, uh, just like learning more about coffee and like, just how how like deep coffee really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I, I want to get into aerospace a little bit yeah, because... Yeah. Um, you know, with aerospace, I feel like anything to do with space, um, building rocket ships, thinking about like um, flight patterns or a- anything like that, you have to be very precise and you have to be very detail oriented, right? Yeah, yeah. I, are you the type of person that is like that or? Yeah, uh, yeah, just paying attention to every detail. Uh, I guess even outside of coffee, outside of aerospace, I really love design as well. Okay. So being nice. like pixel perfect, you know, like yeah, yeah. spending literally minutes just shifting left and right on the arrow key to move yeah. that <laughs> that layer on Photoshop. Right. Um, that, that level of detail is like all about me. So yeah, that's right. In engineering. Uh, especially in space, right? Because um, like reliability is like ninety nine point nine percent. That's actually the requirement for a lot of the components. Oh, wow, that's uh, and that's crazy. crazy to think about is zero point one percent failure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah, perfection is actually a thing there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, looking at like all the rocket launches, and, uh-huh. like from you know SpaceX or anything like that, like so many things can go wrong, and yeah. we've seen even like a SpaceX uh, rocket just 
crash when it's trying to land right yeah um and it's it's crazy to think that we you have to do so much just to get that to land perfectly yeah. um or d- to get it to launch successfully so it's, it's pretty cool yeah oh man i think uh that's one of like the driving forces of why i love space right now is the the fact that you put in a lot of so much work in the ground right like like uh, i guess a good example is like mars curiosity rover mm-hmm. um it took years and years to build that thing build the the whole mission but then it all came to seven minutes of it re-entry into Mars. Mm-hmm. So that's just so crazy to think that people spent like years of their career building it here on the ground. And it all like hinged upon the success of uh, of it flying through Mars's atmosphere in right, seven minutes, right. which is like the most stressful period of that mission. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, also like when you leave Earth's orbit, there's so mm-hmm. much like debris, space debris that happens, right? Do you guys have to worry about um, getting through that, navigating through that? Yeah. Or is it pretty... Um, it, It's not... It's going to be a huge, uh, like, thing. Yeah, it is a huge thing, but it's not as much as you think. Okay. Uh, like, you've probably seen pictures of the space debris. Yeah. Or it I've, looks like it's... I've seen, but, like, animations, yeah, too, of, yeah. like, how much... All know, the there's dots. There's so much around, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's kind of an exaggerated picture because space is huge. There's a lot sure. of space in space. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it's a, it's a issue. And, yeah, um, I work in operations as well, and we do plan maneuvers once in a while to get away from debris. And mm, like, okay. uh, like even like paint flakes, uh-huh. like centimeters yeah. small, like that could um, cause yeah issues, right? Because like you're all the objects that are orbiting space are like traveling in the magnitude of kilometers per second. Yeah. So like in one second, it like three seconds, it basically did a five k. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so even small uh, chips of paint from like your launch vehicle hitting satellites is a huge issue. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the cool thing is, is a lot of these objects are tracked. And you get a, and you, oh, there's a lot of models that can uh, predict the path of other objects in space. Right. So you kind of get a good notice when you're about to hit something, so you can plan to like uh, maneuver out of it. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I've always had those questions, so thanks for yeah, answering yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I I can go hours and hours <laughs> about space. There's so much cool things about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So going back to coffee, because yeah. I think you know your interest in like focusing on the detail will also go into coffee as well because yeah. for a lo- what a lot of people don't know there's a lot of work that puts that gets done into making coffee uh into whether it's sourcing roasting um and then brewing basically yeah. right and and so much more and so um you know what got you into coffee and like why because i think a lot of people at least for me i started getting into coffee just because first I need a caffeine boost and I started adding a lot of sugar or creamer and then I'm lactose intolerant. So it's like, I can't do this for (laughs) a long time. I had to start drinking coffee black and then I started like, okay, you know, what's, what can I do to try out different types of coffee, um, understand more about it and stuff like that. Obviously I don't know as much as you, but you know, how did you get into coffee and uh, you know, what, what really uh, got you interested? Yeah, um, probably like the similar like fashion you did. Like in college, like it was mainly used for like I just need to power through the night right, through right. coffee. It's actually during like, like every senior project. Student. Yeah. yeah, senior project. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, and then uh, over time, right past college, like now, like the career life, coffee was mainly that for that first couple of years of just uh, something to help me uh, stay focused and awake. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then uh, knowing that I spend a lot of my time at work. Uh, and then that whole part of me where I really focus on good quality, like the fact that I'm consuming something every day, um, make sure it's worth it. Uh, that made me care more about the coffee that I drink and just understanding it more. Uh, I think there was also some curiosity of like, why is this coffee better than other coffees? Mm-hmm. Uh, especially living in Los Angeles where there's so many good coffee places everywhere. Uh, just learning why it tastes so good. Also how like the menus are kind of confusing sometimes yeah, at first. Yeah, for sure. So uh, that kind of like, that whole mystery behind it really drove me to learn more about it. Uh, and then uh, how I ended up as a part-time barista is uh, last last year. Al- yeah, almost two. I was almost a, more than a year ago, uh, 2018. Okay. Um, I was also studying for my master's degree at the same time. Uh, I heard about this. Oh yeah, aerop- you're cr- yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> doing so many things all at once. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was this AeroPress competition, the the national championship in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and uh, there was actually a couple of like competitor tickets still open. Okay. So I was like, why not? <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, um, I love you AeroPress. Have nothing to lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no yeah. There's nothing to lose, and like um, uh, I thought it was a cool dare. I just wanted to dare myself, so cool. I, I competed on that um competition, 
Uh, note that this was the, the national championship level. <laughs> uh, so you can actually buy a ticket just to compete that level already. Oh, cool. So it was really intimidating. But uh, I actually like uh, made it to like the semi-final level. Nice. Uh, and like I think that at that like moment and day, that event, uh, that really motivated me to pursue coffee even more. The fact that um, uh, I don't want to say like hidden talent, but like uh, there's just something about coffee that really drew me to be better at it. Yeah. Uh, and then realizing that there's a whole huge community behind it. And so much more story than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So um, with like a, participating in a competition that you've, you're, you you do not know if you're going to win, like, yeah. you know, you're, you're intimidated by the people that you're competing against. Like, are you the type that likes to jump towards something that might be scary, might be intimidating? Like, are you that type of person or was this a initially like a one-time thing where it's like, you know what, I'll try it out. Um, I'm not typically yeah. the type to take risks or anything like that, but uh, I love coffee so much. Like the the love for coffee yeah. kind of pushed you to that. Like, how how are you compared to? How are you towards um, trying out new things? Uh, like super open. I think. Uh, yeah, there was just a sense that I need to try this out because this is just gonna be an amazing like story to tell others. And uh, yeah, yeah, That's and a cool uh, story. yeah, it was just. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a hard thing to describe, but it was just. Yeah, it was definitely a very brave leap into something that I didn't really know about. Yeah. But I knew that I really want to know about it. And what other way than being in a competition like that to yeah. learn more and get really good feedback and just be part of a community that I feel like I can be part of and become a huge contributor to. Yeah. So yeah. when you attended that competition and we'll get to your uh, other competitions yeah. later, but um, going to the AeroPress competition, like what did you learn from that that kind of brought you to where you are now and as well as like you know what made you want to compete in more competitions um yeah just like so how empowering it is mm -hmm. um yeah it's just a great way to validate your skills as a barista and just uh coffee in general like it's something that we consume every single morning yeah and uh, i feel like it's not as appreciated as much even though that there's just so many hands that touch it like especially from farm all the way to uh, to the final person who was holding that to-go cup, right? Right, right. Uh, right here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, devout coffee. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shout out. Shout out. <laughs> and Mel's. Yeah, I think uh, the barista is like the final set of hands that will like basically honor the coffee that it has gone through. And I just really felt that that whole uh, that whole mission of a barista is that um, it's just the right thing to do. The the fact that farmers are basically raising coffee for their livelihood yeah, it, yeah. it's just a show of honor and respect to them yeah and um just showing that honor and respect to your customers and showing that whole story yeah uh, that that really drew me in that that really opened it up for me yeah and uh competitions like these really uh motivate bristas to always show high quality yeah and also learn that aeropress the aeropress competition is like a party too <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah, yeah there's like an open bar and everything oh that's cool um <laughs> yeah my, i invited a lot of my friends to watch me uh, but um, it also like made me learn that coffee community is very welcoming, mm -hmm. especially if you're not uh, even as a beginner or, or novice or amateur. Um, yeah. Anybody can be part of coffee and there's always room for you to be part of it. Yeah. yeah. With the coffee community, I, I think there's this like vision, like people have some idea of the coffee community to be kind of like stuck up or any, you know, uh -huh. like they, they're not as open. But um, how, how would you say that like, you know, would you say that that's totally in invalid? That's totally wrong. Um, and would you say that like, because there's so many, also so many coffee shops that are opening and stuff, are people pretty cool with each other? Or like, do they see each other as comp competitors all the time? Like how, how does it work? Like when you interact yeah. with people? Um, yeah, the cop, okay. First of all, the community is just, they know each other. That's the crazy thing. Like, um, especially in Los Angeles, like everybody, all the coffee shop owners, all the baristas know each other from shop to shop. Okay. And especially like when I visited the Bay, a lot of my, my roaster told me to visit the shop because they're homies as well. So oh, there's a nice, lot of nice. connections. Uh, and that actually makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> uh, the fact that, uh, like your beans are being distributed across the nation. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're basically, your brand is spreading everywhere. So that whole connection, uh, surprised me, but didn't surprise me when I learned about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the. I guess like the 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 snobbiness, the snootiness of being a barista. Right. I think that's uh I don't see it in myself honestly. I don't really see it at the shops I go to either. Um, I think we're it's just the whole welcoming vibe is what I see. Yeah. Uh, 
I feel, yeah, coffee is actually really complicated, especially the many brewing devices out there, many origins and stuff. Yeah. I think that's the new challenge right now is trying to connect people, customers that aren't really into coffee and showing them all this amazing story behind it without like being too snobby about it right, or right. being too like, ex- like mansplaining it. You don't want to do that. For sure. Um, but uh, really show that what you're drinking is amazing. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. So I think I have the same experience as you. I uh-huh. think like when I, um, before I got into like coffee and everything else, I thought that people were really snobby. Um, they were stuck up and um, anytime I want to learn something, they'd probably feel offended <laughs> because I didn't know what, you know, what, what it was. And so like, I didn't know the notes or something like that. Yeah. And um, I think one coffee shop that, well, actually two coffee shops that really helped me um get away from that mindset was uh devout coffee obviously um from you know stevie is one of the founders um he was super cool he was open to chat with me while he was roasting coffee um and uh i don't know i I really liked his vibe um and i really liked their atmosphere but um cat and cloud was like in santa cruz they're they're really cool because um their whole motto is like leaving people happier than they were before and so when i first entered the coffee shop they were like super nice super engaging and we were talking about this earlier um they try to remember your name they took time to like explain to you like oh what are the flavors that you're going to taste in this coffee bean versus this coffee bean and um they were super patient and stuff so um i i I definitely like felt a better vibe about coffee in general just like meeting those people from Mm -hmm. those coffee shops and um i don't know I, i think it's People, like you said, like people are really open to sharing more about the coffee, like, um, you know, culture, learning about like the history about it and like how uh, the bean comes from the farm to like your cup. Yeah. So I I think that's really cool. Uh, Yeah. Like we actually just went to Devout earlier before this podcast, right? Uh, And I pointed out that uh, on their menu, uh, right, right when you go up and order your menu, there's like a little... I uh, think that tells about the bio about your coffee beans, right? Yeah, the, yeah. the altitude, uh, the origin right. and all that. They give all that information. Yeah. Even though the customer might not know exactly what it is, it's right there that they can ask. And I'm pretty sure the, bar- the barista will know everything about it. And I right. think that's one of those little things that you can add. Um, those Just those little things that can really spark uh, that relationship between customer and barista. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly the types of stuff that I love about coffee shops is um, trying to find ways for them to connect. Right, right. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, working at um, at a coffee shop, like, and, and you only work there like once a week, right? Yeah. Just yeah. in the morning. Yeah. And, and this is like along with your aerospace job. Uh-huh. Um, what have you learned from that experience? Like, I guess the, the work that mm-hmm. is put into coffee, like, because before you're probably making it for yourself, yeah. but working making coffee for like other people, like customer service, like what have you learned through that? Yeah, uh, the huge thing was customer service. Like the fact that even though brewing from home, like it's all just you and the coffee, but now you're making it for customers as well. So there's definitely that, uh, the fact that it's important that you serve the right drink first of all. (laughs) Um, And also like, uh, yeah, customer service, uh, making sure that you're there to make their day with their coffee and um, having that warm personality and trying to give that same warm personality towards them. Uh, bring that good vibe basically yeah yeah um sometimes you're the first person that they see yeah, in the morning right yeah. like while they're getting the coffee to start their day for work yeah or yeah and just uh <laughs> yeah just bringing that energy to them uh yeah. especially in the sunday mornings where like probably they just came they just woke up from a huge party from last yeah. night <laughs> trying to get some <laughs> yeah, yeah. coffee get awake again yeah <laughs> that's probably like my regular customer base sunday oh, really? mornings. <laughs> okay is it pretty packed when um, um on sundays it really depends like um sometimes it's slow Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the customers that we pull, um, it's not, there's not a huge rush, uh, but it's a great opportunity to create good relationships and regulars. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then also like experiencing customer rushes as well. That's such a, oh, that uh, must be hectic. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the, that was one of the biggest things is like keeping your cool under pressure. Mm-hmm. Like, even though you have like literally 14 orders coming in yeah. and you're the only barista, it's, uh, being able to do with a smile and like also being precise at the same time, like, like actually dosing uh, to the point one gram accurate. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's really cool too, is like keeping your cool, being right. awesome to customers at the same time and serving amazing drinks. Yeah. yeah. So, so why'd you choose coffee arts district? Like uh-huh. what, um, you know, obviously there are a lot of coffee shops around your area. Probably yeah. there's, 
um, so many that you can choose from. Why did you decide to work from there? Yeah, um, uh, the fact that they were looking for a part time for that t- exact time, but uh-huh. also um, they they barely started. Like they're only more than a year old. Oh, okay. That's very like, young. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they're in an amazing location. I uh, Arts District is probably my favorite location in Los Angeles. I kind of like just watch it transform when I first moved there. Mm-hmm. There's so much change happening there. And um, the space that it invites, uh, there's, it just brings in a whole, like, uh, the fact that this location has, like, a plant shop and a graffiti shop next door, even a barber shop. Like, uh, all in a warehouse. Yeah, like, it's in the in same warehouse, warehouse right? Yeah. That's how you... it, it just pulls in a whole bunch of different people walks of life and uh it's a really cool opportunity to learn about people like that yeah the owner uh his name's aldo he just has a really good vision of the and i really want to follow this vision to like um it's just a really cool experience to watch a coffee shop grow like this so mm-hmm. um yeah just choosing this over other shops i just really want to see that transformation and be part of it yeah yeah and and so did um did you have to work at a coffee shop to compete in competitions uh no, there. I think that's a cool thing is that it's open to everyone. Oh, cool. um yeah. Uh, you don't. Yeah, there's a lot of independents that actually compete. Like even though they might not have like barista experience before, mm-hmm. they they can they they have the skill. And like I think that's a cool part about it is that anyone can compete, and like anything can happen here. Yeah. <laughs> um, um. But yeah, yeah. Cool. So so talking about like the competition is called Brewers Cup. Yeah. Or, okay. So- yeah. Uh, U.S. Brewers Cup. So. Uh, this is all within the umbrella of the U.S. coffee champs. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also a baristas uh, championship as well. That's probably the one that a lot of people know about since there's like a documentary that came out last year. Oh, um, Yeah, it's a really cool documentary about uh, following uh, barista champions competing in the international level. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so U.S. It's on co- Netflix or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, not Netflix, but on YouTube. You can rent it. It's okay. Totally recommend it. You'll see... You'll learn about the intensity about it. Yeah, yeah, I'll like, check it out. Yeah, it's it's super inspiring. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Um, but yeah, uh, U.S. Coffee Champs is like this network of competitions um, that kind of try to select representatives for the international level. Mm-hmm. So while we're competing here in the states, there's also a bunch of other countries that are trying to find their champion for this year as well. Oh. Uh, so Brewers is my the competition I I really like competing in. Uh-huh. Uh huh. That one is where you just uh, do three pour overs two, three sensory judges and basically tell the story, uh, making sure that you call out the right flavors that they, that connects to them mm-hmm. and uh, being just really great customer service. Yeah. So so how, how does that work? Because um, for each coffee bean, uh, they have different notes. They have different aromas. Do, is there like a preference on what you need to have or do you um, just bring your own, whatever you feel really connects with you and then like you kind of explain it and try to convince them that this is the best cup of coffee yeah um i think it's both like you definitely want to use coffee that you feel connected towards too uh but also uh you're looking for coffee that that also plays the the score sheet as well you're looking for coffee that has um this dynamic aspect okay um also like being able to identify the notes in it as well uh so for for a qualifying level competition you do bring your own set of coffee and you can spend like months and weeks just studying this and brewing it over and over again and mm-hmm. try to make sure that uh, the things that you call out about it is correct. Okay. Yeah. And and what coffee did you use? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I used uh, Bidar Roasting. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing like set of people. Uh, I think it's only two people. Shout out to Varen. Uh, but uh, it's from Thailand. Uh, what drew me to using Thai coffee is just the amazing story behind it. Uh, mm-hmm. They're a relatively young country for specialty coffee. Right. And um, yeah. I really wanted to just tell that story. That was like my main driving point was uh, telling the story that Southeast Asian coffee um, is here. And um, I just want to spread the word that you, there's really good coffee coming out of Southeast Asia. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of them are coming from like Mexico, basically like Central America, Ethiopia, mm-hmm. right? Like, But Southeast Asia, there is coffee, like Vietnamese coffee, a Thai, you know, Thai coffee, Indonesian, Philippines, but like, it's not that well known, especially, and it's not ready, readily available in coffee shops, right? Right. So, like, um, do you know? Do you have an idea of like why that's happening, and how yeah. do we get them to bring more Southeast Asian coffees to the coffee shops? Yeah, I think just like uh, showcasing it in competitions and telling the world that there is good coffee coming out over there. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I I basically can tell you the whole story of what I presented at the Breeders yeah, Cup. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, uh, the reason why I like Thai coffee and why I presented it at Brewers Cup is um, 
Also, it's really risky and very like crazy to do something like that because yeah. like nobody's really heard about it. Right. But right. I think that's the main reason is just doing that risk. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, Thai coffee. So again, like I said, it's a very young country that's uh, doing specialty coffee mm-hmm. in the 1950s. That northern region of Thailand, uh, Chiang Rai, mm-hmm. uh, Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai. Uh, that region is like optimal to growing specialty coffee. The high altitudes, as well as the rainforest climate, mm-hmm. the amount of shade and the amount of rain coming in, uh, that's a great place to grow specialty coffee. But during the 1950s, um, that area was actually mainly to grow opium poppy. Oh, so wow. a lot of the farmers were actually uh, growing. Uh, and we're just catering towards like criminal syndicates. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the government couldn't support these farmers at all. They couldn't provide any like uh, road building, schools and development. But um, as the years passed, like in the 1970s to 90s, uh, the Thai Royal Project, uh, this government initiative, um, they do this thing called substitute farming, where we substitute opium poppy for better crops that are more appealing to mass markets. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's so, so especially cool. coffee is part of that list of things that Uh, they recommend to grow rather than something that's not appealing to mass market. Right, right. Uh, And that's the birth of specialty coffee there. Um, uh, There's so much story behind it. (laughs) No, um, that's legit because, you know, the government is helping, like, change their country by, like, providing for, like, at least opportunities for the farmers that were initially growing for something that's not for the mass market. Yeah. So that's really cool. Yeah, and now the government's actually helping out those farmers. They're building roads, they're building schools because uh, as incentive for choosing these crops rather than illegal crops. Right, right. Um, Yeah, and then specialty coffee is just one of those many other substitute crops. Uh, The problem is, though, Southeast Asia... Uh, growing Arabica beans, specialty coffee, mm-hmm. uh, high quality, flavorful beans, it's really challenging because of coffee rust, which is this disease that uh, basically makes the leaf uh, die. Okay. Uh, it looks like co- it looks like rust because like these brown spots in your leaves. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, that's the big challenge in growing specialty coffee in Southeast Asia is trying to find disease resistant uh, coffees. So the Thai Royal Project basically collabed with uh, UN to find a good like uh, varietal to grow for the farmers and recommend it to farmers. So it, it oh, came, wow. uh, it's this, uh, it's Kazimor, which is a hybrid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's also known as the uh, Chiang Mai 80 uh, to honor the king okay. uh, as well. Uh, so Chiang Mai 80 is this coffee that the farmers grow there. And uh, even though it's not like the, it's not a high quality bean at all, mm-hmm. or uh, not at all. I mean, uh, it's not known to be a high quality bean. It, it's just a beautiful story of how like it came to be. And right, I really right. want to brew it for judges and, show that there's just an amazing story behind it yeah so so if you compare like southeast asian you know the thai coffee and maybe like the other southeast asian coffees like in vietnam philippines indonesia yeah. like how is how does it differ from ones from ethiopia yeah. you know guatemala and all of that uh yeah yeah um so there's robusta and arabica beans mm-hmm. so robusta are the more like hardy beans that you can grow like everywhere Mm-hmm. Um, Arabica mainly grows in higher altitudes, so you need to have like that hilly, mountainous area. Okay. But robusta, you can grow; it's more adaptable. So you see it grown very often in Philippines as well. Mm-hmm. Um, robusta beans, um, you see that a lot in the three one instant packets, and that's oh, another. Yeah, yeah. That's Indonesians another. Indonesians have yeah. that too. <laughs> yeah, it's I another used to drink cool. From that. Yeah, it's a really cool talking point too. Is a lot of uh, a lot of that older generation of coffee drinkers in Southeast Asia are more into the three in one packets. Mm-hmm. But there's this whole rising. Uh, this whole rising interest of your younger generation want to try specialty coffee. Right. Um, so it's going beyond the three in one packets that they enjoyed, uh, that their parents enjoyed and trying to show this elevated form. Yeah. Yeah. And, and three in one is like coffee, um, sugar and like yeah. some milk all crystallized so that it's instant, right? Yeah. Like yeah, dissolvable. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I, I grew up drinking that first. Uh, when I first started drinking coffee same, same. Yeah. <laughs> and then I uh, kind of grew out of that because yeah. like it's pretty sweet and then um, obviously like like I said I'm like lactose intolerant so I couldn't really take that but um, that that got a lot of people into coffee so yeah at least it's a start right? well, what's funny is a lot of uh, a lot of companies here in the states are trying to do something like that now is like instant specialty coffee oh so uh, making specialty coffee uh, more accessible in that like instant packet kind right of right stuff. I've also seen the ones where um, they have it in like a almost like a tea bag oh steeped yeah yeah, yeah, steeped coffee exactly so um i mean (laughs) i got that from cat and clouds podcast nice um but yeah they um you know you just brew it like a tea and then you can take it out it's like simple right yeah yeah you don't need a whole pour over device and stuff yeah it's making it super accessible yeah yeah that's cool that it's like going full circle (laughs) yeah it is (laughs) yeah so um 
okay so going back to like the the thai coffee beans um you know what kind of notes or flavors and aromas yeah. that come from it because um i mean this is going to get into detail for people who are interested yeah it is it's so <laughs> we're going straight into this i'm yeah. so like happy to talk about it yeah yeah um yeah yeah because i'm um, interested in it as well <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think i've drink i I don't think I've had the opportunity to drink like Thai coffee. So, oh, yeah. Andy Town, I think they do Thai coffee offerings as well. Okay. In SF. Check okay. them out. Cool. They also do Philippine coffee too. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I'll check it out. Um, but yeah, uh, some more preface. So, uh, specialty coffee, uh, it's known to be specialty coffee when it meets a certain grading scale. Mm -hmm. um, 86 is like what people are trying to search for. Um, so, 86 is like a scale that a lot of graders, there's, there's people that have licenses and like full educations on how to taste coffee and and give that scale rating um but specialty coffee is that grade level mm -hmm. and uh uh this coffee i'm bringing to the competition was uh borderline there okay so it was kind of like an underdog like sure like at these level competitions you want to bring the best out of the best but i saw the best in this because of the amazing story behind it yeah, yeah um definitely but yeah uh the notes behind the thai coffee um, I think that's a whole other thing too, by the way, Kevin. Um, <laughs> can, we, can, we, can we divert on that really sure, quick? Sure, of yeah, course, yeah. of course. Um, we can talk about whatever we want. So. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in coffee bags where you see like the flavor notes, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's like, I don't know, that's one of like the, I guess, controversial things about flavor notes is that it's really subjective. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, also, because in this podcast, I really want to say what I want to say because those flavor notes, I don't want to say it's a lie, but it's really subjective and just don't like when you brew coffee yourself and you taste, if you don't taste it, that doesn't mean that you had a bad tasting experience of the coffee. And that's just different background, right? Right, right, right. Um, I think we're, and that's uh, one of the things I'm trying to like be in the Bristol world in the coffee community is trying to find ways to create new flavor experiences rather than just defining it for others. Sure. Um, and that's what I did in the competition too. Uh, but yeah, I, that, that's something I wanted to say was that the flavor notes are really subjective and it doesn't, it's not supposed to validate your experience when tasting coffee. It's just there as a guideline because those notes are made, uh, defined by someone who has a whole different tasting background than whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. Like sometimes you see lychee as uh -huh. a flavor note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people might not connect that at all, but I'd say like a lot of Asians probably connect it because they've had lychee as a, as a jelly true. dessert. Right, right. That's more identifiable and relatable. So it's based on your experiences of what you've tasted yeah. too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think uh, there's that whole like sub movement um, okay. <laughs> that some people are against flavor notes, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of undermines the whole like uh, like judging of the composition. Right. That's what I was thinking. But, uh, I think that's the fun thing about it is just finding unique ways to connect with judges and just customers in general and what they taste and experience mm -hmm. right uh rather than just saying that this is supposed to taste like earl gray uh, right, maybe right, like right. maybe it tastes like the holidays like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's kind of like how you feel <laughs> yeah yeah using yeah. feeling using colors there's sure. all like these design elements you can add to your bag design mm -hmm. to help um create that experience yeah yeah so like aren't there like ways to get cert certified to say oh i can determine what the notes are yeah and, and so how does that work like um, how do you i'm assuming there's like people who already know the notes and aromas from a coffee yeah. and then they see if you're gonna be able to get the same notes and aromas right yeah Is that uh, how it works yeah yeah uh the sca the specialty coffee association they have like this flavor wheel you probably seen yeah, it. I've yeah. Seen the flavor wheel. yeah yeah um i'm pretty sure the, yeah wine and the beer industry also has like a wheel as well yeah and uh there, there's these standard notes uh they they release this uh like book of definitions of what sweet is what fruity is and stuff right mm -hmm. like you can define like a medium sweetness to the amount of sugar dissolved in a certain amount of water okay that's how you know wow. oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah all these flavors are calibrated by the association oh wow but yeah there's there are these standard notes that you can pull out from that wheel that flavor wheel okay yeah uh i wish i had like a poster on me right now no, but it's like um <laughs> it's like this uh literal flavor wheel uh, and you work your way from inside to out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so like if you taste in a coffee something fruity, you would uh, gravitate towards that portion of the wheel. And then you could work your way out of the wheel to point out what kind of fruitiness. So you taste something fruity. Is it like a citric fruit or is it like a dried fruit? Mm -hmm. And then you sense like a citric fruit. So you, you advance toward that location. And then what kind of citric fruit? Is it like lemony, lime? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that it's stuff. Like yeah, going down to a more detailed yeah. like flavor or something. Yeah, like that. and then yeah, that's basically how you taste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, yeah. I definitely want to try to take more of those classes and just get a better sense of yeah. like how to how to 
taste what I should be tasting or like at least close to what I should be tasting. Um, but yeah, like I think that subjectiveness is like, oh, if you've never tasted lychee, like how do you know this is going to taste like lychee? Yeah. Right. So uh, that's that's interesting. I've, yeah. I don't think I've ever heard people talk about that kind of topic and um, how people, you know, other people's opinions about that. So very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's a. Cool. Yeah, it's really, yeah. There's some really cool activities you can do at home to try and uh, train your taste buds. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the way that um, a lot of standard things to do is like dye uh, or yeah, this little activity is where you get different fruit juices mm. and um, you taste it by itself and you can learn that okay, apple juice tastes like this. Okay. But then you start mixing apple juice and different juices together in a cup. Oh. And then like like switch around the cups and stuff mm-hmm. and like start tasting and identifying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then even putting those mixed cups together. Wow, and, <laughs> that, that's a, and then start identifying that. Too. That's an interesting yeah. way of like trying to train your palate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was a really cool activity I learned from uh, from kindness and mischief in Los Angeles. Uh, the other thing you do is you dye the liquid black so you don't have any bias as well, oh. right? Because pineapple juice right, looks right, yellow. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. There's so much work yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's cool. Yeah, that's part of like the the Q grader test is like uh, like uh, being unbiased. Right. Yeah. Of course. Cool. So going back to the competition, then you're uh-huh. using the Thai coffee. Um, for the people that don't know, how'd you do? Oh, I was short by like 1.0 points to advance to the national competition. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm like super shocked that I went that far. Um, but uh, what, what what was yeah. the like? How did you go from qualifying around like? Yeah, you know? yeah, the whole thing. So uh, again, this is part of the US, U.S. Coffee Champs network of competitions. So you can first compete in the prelims, which is done. Uh, in the city level like Uh major cities hold preliminaries that are open to the public um, and you can compete if you if you place in a top four uh, you basically have a slot for qualifiers uh, which is like the semifinals before it leads up to national championships Mm -hmm. Uh, and in national championships that's where the champion is identified uh, and they go on to internationals which is in Melbourne Australia this year okay Uh, but yeah, uh, I placed in prelims and then moved on to qualifiers. And uh, overall, that experience was crazy, a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, the competition again uh, is you basically brew, pour over coffee to sensory judges, and you have ten minutes to explain to these judges uh, what kind of flavors you're gonna be experiencing and some good story and um, basically why you chose to brew it that way. Right. Right. Yeah. And and what you learned from that experience, kind of like how the competition worked. And, yeah. You know what what can you bring on for next year yeah uh there were so many like little nuances about the way they would judge you and stuff Mm -hmm. uh all these like really nitty-gritty details i didn't care about (laughs) um like the the way yeah one time this judges was like examining the way i was pouring my the water flow rate oh interesting like they were actually counting how many times i go clockwise wow on each pour over device because that's correlated to the flow rate of it Mm mm-hmm uh, so I didn't know that at all. So that's there's a lot of these nuances I want to try again. I'm definitely competing next year because of that. Yeah, nice. Um, and also uh, just the way you present the notes. Like, uh, yeah, it's so like you can just like fire out the notes, right? It tastes like A, B, and C, but trying to articulate it in a very graceful way. Mm-hmm. Like uh, like A followed by B. Uh, like, yeah, kind of like yeah. bringing someone through a journey. Of, like, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly How to it. taste something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just articulating rather than just firing it off to them. Yeah. yeah and and to the people that are listening and and are like what the hell are you they talking <laughs> yeah. about like why why do we care about this I, th- I think people are just like more interested and in, we're not trying to be snobby or anything it's yeah. more of like we r- really have an interest on like what what flavors you taste the journey that you're going through when tasting coffee yeah and people have the same thing for wine um for beer <laughs> right so it's it's no yeah. different and i i think a lot of people are starting to realize that like coffee has the same complexity as wine as beer maybe even more um some people are saying more i guess yeah yeah oh yeah there's so, so many flavor compounds yeah, yeah yeah so so i think people are starting to get into it and it's it's really cool just to like kind of to learn at least for me it's cool to learn more about it and to try to understand more about this coffee bean is totally different from this coffee <laughs> bean and this is why so. yeah yeah before i discovered the whole coffee community i thought i was really weird just like thinking so much about the coffee but then there's yeah. this whole world of people yeah. that are really serious into this thing that we consume every single day yeah it's so like it's so crazy to think about right like yeah. people there's actually nas- international competitions about a thing that we consume every day right right <laughs> and that, that's like sometimes like a necessity for people and they just want that like boost to to start their work you know the caffeine boost 
but um yeah a lot of people just do it for fun and yeah. um i think there's at least there has been a trend for quite some time now of doing a lot more training right so like yeah. um learning how to brew co- cup of coffee um learning the history of how the coffee bean gets to your cup in your hand and stuff like that um did you do any of those trainings or anything like that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Again, the coffee community in LA is just uh, amazing. They always hold events, and all the shops hold like community events to learn more about specialty coffee. So that's kind of like I saw those as like training opportunities. Yeah. Before I was even hired into Coffee Hall, okay. I just I just participated in those community events to just, um, gather more like uh, techniques and stuff. Yeah. As well. And there, there's really good videos about Brewer's Cup on YouTube as well that you can watch. And there's some really good presentations and it really shows the intensity about it. Yeah, I, yeah. I totally recommend you watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. And, yeah. and I, I've been trying to go to like more classes and just to understand and have more experience on trying to learn how to brew different methods. Yeah. Because uh, I, I enjoy like a pour over. Uh, I've done like French press, but I'm not like as good as a barista so you can be uh, yeah i mean you will I, be. You I, will I want be. to i want to learn i want to learn i think it's just fun yeah, yeah. because um for me at least for pour over uh-huh. um i think what's really amazing about that one is uh you have to kind of like it's like a meditation for me it's like yeah. i'm just focusing on the current moment trying to brew like a good cup of coffee and i'm not too worried about what's going on like externally um, I don't necessarily watch TV or something while I do it. I'm yeah. just like focusing on making that. And, you know, what goes into a pour over coffee, like weight, yeah. uh, so water many flow, yeah. like all these things, right? So, yeah, yeah. so it's pretty cool to like yeah. just focus on that. Yeah, I, I agree. Like whenever I, like when my friends start doing pour over, I feel so happy for them because like it is a ritual. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, especially like in the morning, like it's that time that that magical hour between you waking up and going to work right, is like, right. I value that so much. Yeah. Uh, and like, uh, yeah, it's just a ritual where it's just you and that coffee. Uh, pour over is amazing because of how many variables you have to control, yeah. right? The, the water, the flow rate, the grind size, the grind size, even yeah, the, yeah. the brewing device using French press versus like a V60 cone brewer. Mm-hmm. Um, just knowing and learning all those variables and how it contributes to the final cup mm-hmm. um, and how it can vary even with the same type of beans, it's just a cool thing to know about and uh, to practice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that whole ritual aspect is a whole other thing I can talk about too. Yeah. Uh, it just really focuses you on slowing down your life as yeah. well. Yeah. Like, I, agree. I think we've, we live life a bit too fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and coffee is always there to slow us down. Even yeah. though it's kind of counterintuitive that people drink coffee to like get things done. Right. Right. But that whole pour over process or just like enjoying coffee with others in a coffee shop and just slowing down time. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, this kind of goes to um, fika. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so for people who don't know what fika means, <laughs> why don't you explain yeah, it to it? Yeah. Um, it's a Swedish term and a cultural thing too. Is uh, it just to have a coffee uh, with someone, with yourself, and just having a coffee break? Um, it's huge in Swedish culture. I'm not Swedish, but it's a huge thing though. If you ever visit Sweden, right? Uh, people drink coffee there a lot every single day, but they really value fika, and fika is just a thing where uh, you go with, out with your coworkers or your friends every day and just have coffee. And that, yeah. and that again is taking time away from like work, 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 like rush, 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 yeah. and just like hanging out, enjoying your time and like slowing down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Enjoy like a, like a croissant or something. Yeah. 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 So, so, cool. so I think, um, we get this notion of coffee is like caffeine and we need to like use it as a boost to help us throughout our day and like work hard, whatever. Yeah. But I think, fika and like just the idea of hanging out chilling just yeah, having a yeah. cup of coffee with someone is like it, it sounds nice yeah I th- yeah i, I, really I didn't cool. even know there was a term for it too like i do it all the time right, right. So like and i just accidentally found out oh wait there's a word for this yeah. I was like oh wait that's yeah. so cool and there's a whole country that practices it <laughs> yeah i think like <laughs> that that just shows that um and I, I mean i don't know if there's like a real one word for in the english uh, dictionary for that but i think just having a word for that in any culture just shows what kind of um way they handle you know slowing down and like resting and like uh being present into the moment yeah i think that's yeah. that's very important and like having a culture that focuses on that and has a word for something like that is really cool yeah yeah i agree so so when you um work at um the coffee shop are you like what got you to doing that because like obviously you have your aerospace work but 
you know, how do you, yeah. why do you want to find <laughs> time to do yeah. it? Like spend an extra day working. Yeah. Like how, how do you feel oh, about man. it? Uh, I still think about that question too. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Well, I guess the, the, the main question maybe for me is like uh-huh. when you wake up for work and maybe you really like aerospace. So yeah. I, I don't, I don't doubt that you enjoy working, mm-hmm. but like waking up an extra day on a weekend, on a Sunday <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, to work true. at a coffee shop. Yeah. Like, how do you feel doing that? Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy to think about too. Like, I can't believe I'm doing this at yeah. the same time. Yeah. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a passion. I think, um. Uh, it's just something that I feel like uh, I want to be part of. I feel I can make a huge change in it. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I love doing. Yeah. Uh, it's something that I do almost every day is making coffee. So why not for others and mm-hmm. showing that same passion to others and hopefully um, they might learn about it and practice it as well. Because I think it's a really uh, important and awesome thing to be doing. Yeah. It's just uh, not just coffee, but just finding, carving out that time for yourself to do something that you super love um, and you want to like flourish in, uh, even whether it be like in the competitions, like participating competitions or just learning more about it. Uh, I'm still trying to understand why I'm doing this, but, okay. <laughs> but it's just something that part of me is like, I totally love waking up to and, uh, being part of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, um, that's something that a lot of us is great to have because uh, like when you're working your full time, sometimes you need something that you really enjoy to take your t- yeah. mind off of it and stuff uh-huh. like that so yeah i think really cool. yeah yeah it's like something it's so like different than my space side i feel like i'm a whole other person working behind a bar versus working in the office i think that's a, a other cool aspect about it um it's like a like another like aspect of me i've never seen myself and i really want to explore it yeah very cool yeah, yeah i i think uh because you're at the beginning of stages of your like barista career yeah i think um it's cool to learn about yourself and like just try out new things and see yeah, where it yeah, goes it is, it is cool yeah uh yeah just super happy that i got to do something like that so yeah, yeah I'm, I'm continuing exploring it i'm still i'd still consider myself as a baby barista uh and i'm still learning a lot but uh, i'm just really happy to be in this state of where i can just pour out my passion for it yeah definitely yeah i look forward to what you're what you doing <laughs> yeah. next and uh yeah. next time you have the competition hit, hit us up Yo, yeah, let people know um we'll all we'll all support you yeah just watch that documentary you'll be inspired yeah <laughs> for sure for sure I'll, I'll put it in the show notes or something so cool uh so i think it's a perfect time to go to instagram questions i ha- oh, had yeah. a few people who asked questions um from you know our friends and stuff oh, like yeah. that so i'm just going to ask these questions and um feel free to oh, answer yeah. it anyway uh, so the first question is from Kuma Girl, uh, Kristen. Oh, Kristen. Guy. Shout out. Um, she asks two questions. Uh, the first one is, how do you manage your time between aerospace, coffee, and other things like hanging out with friends, mm-hmm. pretty much, Shrika? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I think, um, oh, I'd say, yeah, definitely setting boundaries, like um, promising yourself that you'll leave work at this time um, will h- really help. Uh, making sure that you carve out time for the things that you enjoy as well yeah um uh there's a lot of sacrifice behind the scenes as well that i uh that i don't really share too but um in general basically there's a lot of sacrifice um knowing what's important each and every single day and doing whatever needs to be done that day um you'll find time i think that's the the key thing is that you'll find time Mm -hmm. uh you'll balance things out you'll figure out things that you really care about and then there will be things that will fade away um sadly but um um there there are things that you really value and you're gonna put out time for that and you'll find time yeah. and it doesn't have to be um yeah you'll you'll find time you'll find time it's all about prioritization right yeah. like I, I think um there's so many things that you can do oh, like yeah. even your interests right whether it's yeah. like um making coffee um hip-hop dance like you know watching movies blah 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 but like you want to prioritize your your list of activities so that you know which one that you really want to do and then you focus on that and forget about the rest sometimes and that's why things die out right yeah uh, so i and think things can wait like things can wait some too. some yeah remember uh yeah that chris baka he does vlogs and there's like his whole video about things can wait that was a huge yeah thing yeah. um some things don't need to be done today but you can push it back right right um, mm-hmm. shout outs to chris baka yeah <laughs> so good um yeah so I, I think prioritization is really important yeah. so um cool 
Uh, the next question from her is, what's the biggest thing you learned from the coffee community and pursuing your passion? Oh, I guess besides prioritization. Oh. Um, uh, the people, I think that's the biggest thing I've learned is um, uh, the way you interact, the way you represent yourself to customers, uh, your manager, your people, your, your, your co-baristas. Um, just uh, knowing that your energy, your enthusiasm is infectious. Mm -hmm. uh, and just having that positive attitude. Uh, I, yeah, that's the biggest thing I learned is that the way you present yourself to others does become a huge influence. Um, so making sure that um, you stay true, you show your true self, uh, first of all, and uh, transferring that to others. Like even though it's really subtle, like, mm -hmm. you, don't, like you don't really feel transferring... <laughs> it sounds mystical, like transferring energy, but like um, the way you present yourself to others makes a huge impact. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Even though it doesn't feel like you are, um, especially like regulars that you don't even really know who they are. But as over time, you'll start learning about each other, even though like you don't see them all. You don't, you don't even know them. Like, you know how like a lot of our friends are from college and people we've struggled with over right, years and years. Right, right. Um, this like different form of friendship where you're seeing like as a customer um, that's just a whole new dynamic. Yeah, um, I agree. But yeah, yeah, I I think like especially if, uh, like I said, like they're the first per you're the first person that they see in the morning yeah. when they need huh? to get their cup of coffee. It's like that kind of interaction, a good interaction or bad interaction can affect the rest of their day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's like some mornings where like, oh no, I guess the regular wasn't visiting today. Yeah, yeah. yeah like where are they? Yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. you have that special bond in a yeah. different way than yeah, like yeah. a college friend. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Um, the next question is from Mark Mark nine two one. He asks, "Do you have coffee groupies?" Coffee groupies? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, uh, yeah. Like people just like randomly DM me. I, I don't even know them about like coffee tips and stuff. Oh, wow. uh, which is awesome. And like, even like, uh, I had some, there was a really good memory. Like right after I performed a couple of people like approached me and asked me some really good insight and questions about like why I brew it that way. Uh -huh. Um, so, uh, maybe not groupies, but just like fans, okay. like just, uh, just, uh, I made so many amazing friends through coffee that I never expected. And it's really cool. People asking me questions, even though I still consider myself as a novice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm still learning a lot, but like, it's really cool that people are just, uh, want to learn. There's that, there, there's that people that are just willing to learn. Yeah. And I, I see that in myself too. That's how I started too, was just randomly asking people, why would you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. Uh, there's just people that visit the shop and ask questions all the time. That's cool. Yeah. I pick my brain as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, I think when when you do something coffee related, I DM you on Instagram and just oh, like, yeah. oh, you know, I wish you. I, I, I'm a groupie. I, <laughs> I'm a fan. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I always like to see you like competing or doing something with coffee, and it's like I'm just there to root you on. So yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. <laughs> um, cool. The next question is from Vince nine seven eight. Uh, this is an aerospace question. Oh, nice. Uh, he he asks the idea. Uh, that is getting cheaper to bring a payload to space. Um, yeah. What exciting new technologies and applications do you think can come from this? That's yeah. question number one. Yeah. Um, I think uh, this is Vince, right? From yeah. Cal Poly. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Cal Poly is like the birth of CubeSats. Mm -hmm. So we've probably seen CubeSats evolve during our time there. Okay. But that's made space super accessible for university teams as well. Like students can send stuff to space now. Uh -huh. um, yeah. The next big thing I see is just a small sat. The, the small CubeSat, MicroSat mm -hmm. um, technology. Um, the fact that things are getting smaller, uh, we can install smaller science instruments and into these smaller platforms. So you're going to have a lot more organizations rather than like the big name organizations sending out satellites. Mm -hmm. You can you have uni literally university teams of five to six people building CubeSats and it's getting cheaper and cheaper to yeah. launch things. Um, and just having, yeah, it's just... Space is super accessible now. That's great. Low Earth orbit is really accessible. Yeah. yeah. It, especially for students who are getting into aerospace or are interested in space, like the the room for entry is pretty easy now. Like the the idea that they can get into participating and contributing to like creating satellites and stuff, that's yeah. really cool, especially yeah. as a student. And it's compounded by like launch vehicle companies being more reusable, like reusing items. Uh, right, right. Like going all electric, like Rocket Lab is uh, one of those companies that are 
doing the all electric propulsion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so space is just getting more accessible over time. That's yeah. cool. Nice. Yeah. Uh, his second question is: If Elon or Jeff Bezos, Elon, if Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos offered you a chance to send anything you want into space for free, what would it be? Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and this is Hold just on. a fun question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh man, something for free. Uh, <laughs> it just came out of my head, but like coffee. Okay. Like, like try to like see the atmospheric effects of coffee as you send it to space. Yeah. There, there was that one. I remember reading an article about people like roasting coffee as it climbs over altitude because of different environmental aspects of it. Uh-huh. Um, so that'd be really cool. Yeah. <laughs> that was such a really interesting question. Yeah, yeah. I think coffee just came out of mind. <laughs> yeah, it, it seemed like a fun yeah. question. <laughs> um, oh, that's cool. Yeah. I'll think about that more. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. The next question is from Car- Karina Graham. Uh, <laughs> what, are, what are some things that you've learned about yourself participating in a competition? Yeah, um... Putting myself in a competition setting um, made me learn that uh, I'm a really good presenter. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't come off as a prideful way to say that, but uh, um, I mean, if you know about myself, yeah, if you know about that about yourself, yeah. then that's good. Yeah, I just learned so much about presenting to people. I think, I think that's the best way to say that was uh, um, the fact that you're making coffee at the same time while presenting your judges a very complex story in a matter of ten minutes. Yeah. Um, that made me, that really trained me and I learned so much about being confident in myself, uh, really believing in myself. If you ask me if I'm a presenter two years ago, I'd probably be very hesitant, <laughs> yeah. like uh, doing presentations. Right, right. But the me now, um, I just really love being in front of people and presenting and being part of like things like podcasts. Right. Uh, just, uh, I don't know, it just really unlocked this whole confidence in me that I never knew. And um, it's just something that I really want to get better at in general is just learning how to present complex things mm-hmm. um, to more uh, ingestible ways for others. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's the biggest thing I learned from coffee competitions was uh, being able to present complex ideas in short form. Right. And yeah. it's cool that you got to learn from, like, get experience from it through something that you're passionate about. Yeah. And so, scary. Oh, yeah. It was scary, scary. I'm sure. Yeah. The, the couple of minutes before the competition, I was like a nervous wreck, yeah. honestly. <laughs> But like, um, just thinking about the community and how awesome it is, uh, kind of like, oh yeah, when you perform, I'm pretty sure like, like you, you perform as well, like in dancing as well. Yeah. yeah it's that definitely. whole, uh, like rush of adrenaline that, oh, oh you're actually sure. doing this. You prepared for it. Yeah. 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 And, and you kind of just get into this flow yes, at, at flow some state. point. Yeah, flow yeah. State. yeah. Cool. Uh, her second question is, um, does coffee equipment matter to you and what's your favorite if so? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it definitely plays a huge role in the way you, the final brew comes out. Uh, my favorite coffee equipment, my favorite brewing device right now is the Torch Mountain Dripper. This is the same uh, pour-over device I used in competition. Okay. Uh, first of all, it comes in this pink ceramic, and that's so cool. It comes <laughs> in a really cool color. Nice. Um, second, it's like bold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just stands out yeah. in the competition. It just looks really cool. I yeah. got a lot of comp- compliments about it. Uh, nice. And all I said was like, oh, yeah, it's just it comes in this cool pink. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, uh, the key aspect about it, though, is the if you ever so just search it, Torch Mountain Dripper. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a huge opening aperture. So what that means, it has a faster flow rate. Mm-hmm. So what that does is uh, your the extraction focuses on the fruity, acidic compounds that are extracted initially in that first uh, because of that fast flow rate. Mm-hmm. You're not getting that steeping effect as opposed to other brewing devices like a like a Hario V60, mm-hmm. uh, where sometimes uh, when you pour water, it just sits there for a long time, so yeah, it's steeping. Yeah, yeah. But this one is more like just mechanically washing out that, that flavors. fruity flavors. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And th- does that mean that like it's better to have fruity coffee yeah. than like maybe the more chocolatey stuff? Yeah, because that's, uh, yeah, those bitter, darker notes are mainly focused on the final minutes of extraction. Mm-hmm. But if you really want to highlight like fruity, acidic stuff, um yeah i found this pour over diet device really significant in doing that okay yeah is, is that your flavor of choice like the yeah the yeah of choice yeah because the stuff? i think that challenges the way people think what coffee is like when true. i went, that yeah that's true yeah usually people think of coffee as really like chocolatey nutty right but right. then when i prepare like this really acidic like juicy thing for others like it shocks them i think yeah. that's a that just seeing their faces trying out that this is what I think coffee is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it really blows their mind, and that I think that really like sparks the the need. I mean the the search for new coffees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. <laughs> yeah. I, I think like 
when you pour them a good coffee like that's different uh, yeah. and that differs from what they expect is like you know yeah you, you, they they it opens up to so many yeah. new possibilities uh that, that's a, that's another thing of why i chose uh, thai coffee um so katamore um i don't want to say notorious but a lot of like people think katamore coffee beans are kind of like low quality um like general coffee that tastes nutty and stuff mm-hmm. but using that portable device in competition it really highlighted more sweeter notes like um okay. there's like this huge lime note that everybody can taste from it and i really wanted to highlight that it, it came from those beans wow. yeah yeah lime, lime, yeah uh, it, notes, i wish i could make cool. that for you it's like it, it has this lime note that is so there yeah yeah maybe next time yeah next yeah, time yeah. We, and it shocks people because like <laughs> usually you associate that varietal as a uh, very nutty uh coffee but then you taste this lime's like wait a minute right right yeah and this is from thailand too yeah what that, that, that's cool <laughs> yeah all right i gotta try that one yeah <laughs> Uh, so the final two questions basically is what's next for you and coffee? Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, next for me. Yeah. 2020 is going to be a crazy year. I have some like pretty lofty goals <laughs> this okay. year. Um, I, I'd see for me, I really want to bring my engineering skills in the space world. I really want to merge, um, engineering and my design background as well. I do a lot of freelance design, uh, and from this coffee thing, um, I really enjoy, uh, presenting right mm-hmm. presenting really complex subject matter to different audiences and uh, I do the same type of stuff at work as well okay like space is super complex right yeah uh, uh, I work on data that I've poured over year uh, not years uh, weeks and weeks over and over mm. uh, and my team knows that right we the team works on that same data but being able to present that to program management to even like high schoolers mm-hmm. how do you present something so complex to high schoolers in like a class? classroom setting Mm -hmm. uh to do like public outreach so um i'm trying to work my way towards that is like merging the way merging like engineering and presenting it okay nice uh and then for coffee i'm definitely competing again i learned so much about it yeah and um yeah uh, i'm going to continue working as a barista it's i definitely have time to do it now um uh there's just so much to learn espresso is a whole other monster by the way like yeah. there, there's oh yeah pour over and then espresso there's so much into that too. yeah yeah so i'm i'm lear- learning that too latte art is another thing yeah yeah, yeah yeah definitely yeah uh cool so if people want to follow you on social media or anything like that yeah. where where should they go yeah uh i'm on instagram down to fika d-o-w-n period t-o period fika f-i-k-a that's my handle cool. yeah yeah, thank you for coming, man. Oh, it, yeah. It's oh, great to catch gosh. up, and uh, thank yeah. you for coming for the last few hours. Yeah. Of the day. <laughs> I'm so glad this worked out, Kevin. It's yeah, so awesome. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, I'm really happy about that. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Cool. Bye, everyone. Yeah. That was good. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. That was-